and I'd like to thank you for attending the Bucknell University and volunteer crowd webinar. We're really happy to have you here this evening. I'd also like to thank our hosts, the National Society of High School Scholars, and personally thank all of the teachers, the parents, and the students, and anyone else in the audience who's joining us. And we'd also like to thank the individuals who registered for the event, um, but will be listening to the recorded version following Passover. And uh, I also want to just let you know that we'll be taking your questions uh, throughout the presentation. So please, by all means, if you hear anything and have some questions, let us know and we'll try to answer those real time. And so before we get uh, started, I'll just give you a little bit of my background and then turn it over to William Conley of Bucknell University for his part of the presentation. My name, as I mentioned, is Amy Von Kainel and I created Volunteer Crowd. It is a volunteer platform and it's made just for students, whether middle school student, a high school student or a college student. It's a place for you to go to and find volunteer opportunities that are meaningful for you, whether it's academically meaningful, personally enriching, and uh, create a volunteer transcript that you can use as a stepping stone to higher education and employment. So we'll be sharing more about that a little bit later. And uh, I'm turning it over to William Conley now, Bucknell University. Thank you. And, and thank you, Amy, and the National Society of High School Scholars for sponsoring the webinar. Um, I, I've been in admissions for now, uh, this is my 40th year. And prior to that, I was an AP US history teacher. So these, uh, first let me extend um, my best wishes that those listening and those close to you are well, um, socially distancing and take care in your, taking care of yourself. I also know that um, as a former teacher, how um, strange it is that everybody from high school, well, elementary through college are learning remotely now. And uh, that's a, a, a significant undertaking by everyone. So it's probably only appropriate that we are coming to you remotely, talking about uh, the role of volunteering in college admissions. So um, I'm happy to uh, profile Bucknell University, which is a undergraduate um, university of 3,600 students in uh, Lewisburg, Pennsylvania, a small town in central Pennsylvania. Um, we actually have um, colleges of arts and science, engineering and management. So uh, a small university, but with quite a breadth of um, educational opportunities. And in the this opening slide, um, I extracted a bit of our uh, mission that you would see at the front of our uh, college catalog and our, our view book and uh, website. And I think what I wanted to point out was that last sentence, um, Bucknell seeks to educate our students to serve the common good and to promote justice in ways sensitive to the moral and ethical dimensions of life. So we clearly state that um, our mission is not only the intellectual development of students um, and in, a, in today's world, kind of the credentialing that they come out uh, career ready, um, near term and long term, but also with a, a set of uh, a, a moral compass uh, that matters. So when we um, look at what do we mean by the common good, and probably the best example I could give you is living this mission. Um, you can put things in words and then you look around and say, but where do they actually do this? How do they demonstrate that the words are action? So we have an Office of Civic Engagement at Bucknell University, and um, it really underscores the importance of how do our students get those kind of um, experiences that are beyond the, the cognitive academic. And so again, um, bear with me, I, I will read a, quickly this notion of we help students explore the world outside the classroom through community service and service learning opportunities 
students gain a better understanding of the world around them and experience firsthand the issues that affect our local community and communities across the globe. And if anything express better the interrelationship between our local community and the world is COVID-19. That it's, you know, a world um, challenge, not a local challenge or a national challenge. Um, we, this year, we inaugurated a first time um, in civic engagement scholarship for three entering students in our freshman class. Um, again, putting real meaning behind the sense of if we say that the common good matters, how do we demonstrate it in real terms? So um, Kaylee Sullivan uh, wrote a wonderful essay um, as part of an assignment, but really talked about, um, she went from a, a high school career of active volunteerism that allowed her to roll up her sleeves amongst many people in doing various things. And then suddenly with the COVID-19, being unable to do those volunteer activities given social distancing and other restrictions. And what she realized is, is that there are a lot of ways um, with even in this envelope that she could make a difference. And so um, this is really to just underscore that um, universities and Bucknell is not alone. And I'll talk a little bit later about how mission and selection of students work together. But I, I know that many of the universities around this country have the same commitment to the common good. And we'll talk a little bit more about how that um, works itself out or expresses itself in the admissions process. But as a former teacher, um, I would be remiss if I didn't have a little quiz to start. So what I'd like you to do uh, out there in uh, webinar land is to, um, I'll give you about a minute because I want top of mind response. We have four questions here and I'd like you to um, take the next minute or so and answer the questions as you see fit. And I'd like to look at the results and then move into um, more of my presentation. So uh, the survey is open. Please respond. I can feel and hear wheels turning out there. Okay, give you about 10 seconds to wrap up. As I said, just top of mind, Well, maybe my friends in the back room can show us um, how the uh, audience responded to these questions. Okay, we'll end voting and share the results. Okay, here you go, Bill. Okay. Well, pretty, um, a pretty astute audience. So um, on the first question, there are 3,000 uh, four-year colleges in the country. So I'd say this uh, group did pretty darn well on that. Um, they did even better on the next one. What was the average admission rate? Um, indeed, it was 65%. Um, and again, that question was asked as I'll, 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 I'll tell you more about why I asked that question. 
and uh, what percentage of students attend four-year colleges that admit fewer than 30 percent? Um, it's three percent. So only three percent of cur students currently enrolled in four-year colleges are at colleges that admit uh, fewer than 30 percent of their um, students. So that's a, a pretty significant um, uh, statistic. And this was kind of a trick quiz, and it really was to, there are certain universities and colleges whose core mission is volunteerism in the sense that their students um, essentially don't pay tuition. They work for the university. They are doing um, their, so to speak, volunteers because they're not getting a paycheck. Um, their hours are going towards um, support of the institution. So there's a consortium of colleges um, among those. So all of the above are work colleges um, and they're a very interesting set of schools. Now, when this is an interesting statistic because those are, that's the core mission, but many institutions have a, a, a volunteerism that is not embedded in the work college, but there are schools that that is the way students afford to attend those colleges, that they volunteer throughout their undergraduate years in support. So we'll go on to the next um, slide. Um, and so here it is. I, I, I wanted to bring up this notion about how many schools there are, because there is no standard application process. The United States is the most um, vibrant higher education system in the world. Uh, no country comes close to the number of institutions available to students. So we talked, we agreed there's 3,000. Uh, they're public, they're private, they're large, they're small. They're highly selective, um, and remember, on fewer than 3% would attend what we would call highly selective schools. 97% of students are attending schools that admit north of 30%, and some of them are open admission, meaning that the student only needs to submit the application and a high school, uh, high school uh, degree or GED to be admitted. So um, when we talk about how volu why volunteerism matters, it's going to matter, frankly, in a small subset of that 3,000. It's going to matter among schools that operate or uh, use what we call holistic admission. That is that in addition to um, the academic credentials, a student's high school transcript, their grades, the rigor of their courses, their testing. Um, they also ask information about the student's level of uh, engagement outside the classroom, what we call extracurriculars within the school community, but it also is um, volunteering outside the school community, work experience. We wanna know if they're caring for siblings at home or parents or grandparents, those are important dimensions of a student's life. And so in holistic admission, we are not just looking at the academics or what we call cognitive measures. We're also looking at those um, personal qualities. And that's where the notion of the volunteerism comes in. So let me drill down a little bit. How do we do it at Bucknell? So what we've, there are a lot of um, what we call character attributes. Um, and you can go into, um, if you want to Google a great site, it's called the Character Lab. And um, Angela Duckworth um, directs that at the University of Pennsylvania. She's written a, a book called Grit. And uh, just a tremendous um, website um, to see how they catalog all these variety of character attributes. 
But on the left hand side of this, these behavior or character attributes that we look for in the application, um, leadership, empathy, determination, grit, um, creativity, self-regulation, these are elements that are not going to be measured like an SAT score on a 200 to 16 or 200 to 800 scale or an ACT one to 36. Um, in a way, they're subjective. Um, they're in the eye of the beholder, but we have what we call a rubric. We, we have all of the readers go through a rigorous training process where they come to a common definition of what do we mean by empathy and where do we find evidence of a student being empathetic or a student having persistence and grit uh, of creativity. And we do what we, we call a calibration. We take 10 applications and Every reader, and we have something like 15 readers at Bucknell because we have nearly 10,000 applications, and we are taking, we're reading them front to back. So we take 10 applications and we have 15 to 20 readers all doing the same thing and then finding out who judged the student to be empathetic and who didn't see it at all. And we talk about why where did you see evidence of this student's character um, attribute and you didn't? So we understand it's not um, a scientific objective um, criteria. It is subjective, but we do a lot to make sure that we have a common understanding of what that means. Um, and so, I lay this out and some of you might be out there saying, yeah, that sounds really good, Bill, but we read all about varsity blues um, and the scandal of how some parents were able to get their kids into selective colleges um, on false credentials, um, hardly what we would call a positive character profile. Um, and I understand that that has left college admissions, particularly selective admissions who say they, they look at the whole person and they are careful to make sure that these are bona fide credentials. Uh, but something like this comes along and um, it, it suggests that it's rigged or this is not as um, honest and open as you presented. But the fact is those were very anomalous circumstances. Um, and by and large, what we do know is that it has created even a greater commitment to being fair and equitable in our assessment of student um, qualities and their credentials. Um, so I would say, yes, we're aware, especially among selective admissions, that we're under a microscope. Uh, we have a public who is a little bit skeptical about how we do it and how fair we are. And of course, I'm not here to defend our, our process, but rather to say um, those were anomalous and by and large students are applying to schools who will value the true um, qualities that a student presents. And so, also happening at the same time as Varsity Blues and this skepticism about the integrity of college admissions has been a growing momentum um, to value character and what we would call the non-cognitives um, in the process. And why do we do that? Because we are concerned um, that the sense among the public is it's about testing high stakes testing. It's about, are you in the right school district? Is it about, were you able to do a volunteer service for which you paid $5,000 to do in Costa Rica? Or, you know, these kind of privileged opportunities. Um, there is a momentum now to recognize that character is critically important 
and can be um, learned and developed in multiple ways. So a couple of examples, uh, Bucknell University and volunteer crowd that Amy um, heads up, we are members of the Character Collaborative. It's a group now of more than 70 uh, institutions, public, uh, I mean, uh, universities, secondary schools, um, testing agencies, the ACT and um, the College Board. Uh, there's a group, a, a, a collaborative working together to develop the tools that can help admission offices identify and in a sense reward character. And the secondary schools um, and K through <clears throat> eight developing programs within the structure of the school that make character matter. Um, again, empathy, grit, <clears throat> persistence, those qualities, <clears throat> excuse me. Another initiative is making care in common and that comes out of the Harvard um, Graduate School of Education. <clears throat> and it, it, I, I love this lead into their mission. Our vision is a world in which children learn to care about others and the common good. Treat people well day to day, come to understand and seek fairness and justice and do what is right even at the times at a cost of them to themselves. Um, this is again, another group trying to develop um, curricula that organizations and schools can adopt. And finally, there was a major report, um, the second one coming out called Turning the Tide. And the tide that we were turning is this tide of the numbers game, the cognitive, that it's the SAT score and the class rank and you know the, the school district that those were the coin of the realm for gaining admission. And it was creating in some of those sectors a high level of stress among students, anxiety among parents. And by the way, one of the key uh, leaders in turning the tide is MIT. Uh, and of course, many people, you know, they admit about 7% of their students um, and they're an institute of technology and yes, numbers matter, but when they have the opportunity to admit so few and basically their whole applicant pool is able to do MIT work, where do they go to make distinctions? They go to character and qualities that are not measured by SATs. Um, we recently, um, this past summer, we co-sponsored, uh, the Co Character Collaborative co-sponsored with the National Association of College Admission Counselors, a, their, their annual survey never included um, the notion of character attributes themselves in the selection. And so for the first time, they asked college admission officers about the role of character. And uh, this is where I think I can really underscore for the audience, especially the students in the audience, that um, overall at the top, if that top section, 70%, 71% of all survey respondents, be they public institutions, private, whatever their level of selectivity, they collectively, considered character attributes of considerable or moderate, at least moderate importance. So nearly three out of four colleges are saying that matters, they look at it. Now, if you drop down by selectivity, this is where it really, I think, becomes particularly uh, pronounced. Um, and that among the schools that admit fewer than 50%, Basically, 100% of them say that character is considerably important or at least moderately important. Um, and that's a powerful commitment, a powerful statement about um, how colleges feel about character. Um, and so 
there again, here's a, a, a slide that just kind of recap, recaps some of the things I've already said. But, um, and Amy's gonna talk a little more about this. Why does it matter beyond getting into college? Because I always tell people getting into college is just the small part of it. You wanna get through college. You wanna be successful in college. And at Bucknell, we administer just before orientation, a uh, what we call the student strength inventory. And I always like to tell the students, it's you don't have to brag anymore. You've been admitted, you've enrolled. Now this is about learning more about you. And so this um, survey of 52 questions ends up um, collecting a sense of where they are in these non-cognitive competencies. And the ones that emerged as really important, uh, and I mentioned here is self-efficacy, meaning how well does a student take care of themselves and, um, and affects change for themselves, their resilience and their engagement. And the engagement piece is a clear connection with volunteerism. What we found is that the students in the SSI who score high on level of engagement, resilience, and self-efficacy have a higher likelihood to graduate on time. And at Bucknell, 90% of the students that enter as a first year student will graduate. So we don't have a retention problem, but those who are engaged and make a commitment are more successful than others. So with, with that, I'm going to turn over this to my colleague, Amy, and um, Amy, all yours. Thank you, Bill. And uh, I'm going to follow uh, Bill's lead and start off with a survey. And this is really just so I understand what to emphasize as I'm talking about volunteering. So we'll just take a minute here and let everybody just answer this one question about why they're here. Um, to learn more about volunteering and where should we do a deep dive in volunteering? Because it's such a vast topic and there's so much to it. How do you volunteer? Um, what type of projects are best for you? When you, when you show up to a volunteer opportunity, what do you do? What's, what's the right thing to do? Um, and then what experience do you want to take away with you? What type of impression do you want to lead? So let's see, I'll wait until we get to about a little bit more. <laughs> and thank you, Bill. That's, it's really helpful to hear what happens when students leave high school and also the perspective that a college has about volunteering and why it's not only important to volunteer when you're in high school, but to take that habit of a lifelong dedication to giving back with you into that next chapter. Okay, so almost there, and uh, we'll give it a five-second countdown. Okay, I think we're there. All right, so let's see if these line up with some of the questions that I'm used to seeing. Um, so how can I find virtual volunteer socially distant opportunities? That is a really great question. And that's the question that we've been answering for about three to four weeks now. And the good news is, is that we've got some really good answers for you that we're going to share a little bit later in the presentation. And I just want everyone to be encouraged that there are a lot of great ways for you to get involved and to support your community, even from the comfort of your home. So we'll make sure that that gets addressed. And then how do I find volunteer opportunities? Well, that's one of the reasons we created Volunteer Crowd is we recognize just how difficult it is to find volunteer opportunities and not just any volunteer opportunities, volunteer opportunities that are close to you, that are um, relevant to your age, that are relevant to your interests, that match your schedule. There's so much that goes into it. And then I think our other one is what kind of service projects should I choose? So we've got a lot about that as well. Okay, so we'll go back here. Uh, 
a lot of people are really shocked when they see this number. Um, parents spend over a hundred billion dollars a year um, to get their students college and career ready. And that's very significant. I mean, we're spending about 32 billion a year on tutoring. Um, great investment, right? Um, my son needs to know the Pythagorean theorem. I'm sure everyone else out there needs to know it as, as well. Test prep. You want to be ready for those AP tests and also the ACT and SAT and put your best foot forward. Extracurriculars. That's really gratifying to see how much parents are spending just on enrichment, learning a new skill, whether it's music, a language, a sport. Um, it's about developing ourselves as full-fledged individuals. And then the other category of volunteering, that seems to be to pale in comparison. And it's really interesting. There's a few reasons for that. Um, one of the reasons is that volunteering has really long been the domain of churches and schools and nonprofit clubs. Um, maybe you have a local community center. Maybe you're a member of National Charity League. And so those are all really great organizations and they get students very far in volunteering. And sometimes there's more that's needed to that because a student's need is broader. But the point here really is that um, we're investing dearly in trying to help our children get to that next level. And when you step back, you can see there's a huge investment for students and we're be all becoming, well, we, <laughs> the generation uh, we're raising is becoming superhuman. I mean, I'm in awe of what all you can do. And really what volunteering is about is being allowed to be human and what you can learn and experience as part of that, um, as part of being human and learning to be human and, and enjoying that process. And so, Bill, I just wanted to check back in with you. Um, students are very goal oriented. And when we talk about some of those character attributes, um, how do students balance, I want to develop this in myself and um, develop my character attributes, but avoid that perfection trap where you're trying to achieve a specific goal regarding um, character development because obviously with GPAs and test scores there's a there's a goal in mind but um, right. can you speak a little bit to what some of the the goals might be for character development and and how to look at that as just personal development rather than goal oriented I think that Amy I'm glad you asked that because I think there's many people who are again uh, a little if not skeptical cynical about um, we figured out how to uh, work the system on testing. We do test prep or, you know, we know how to get a better GPA. We take a slightly less rigorous course load or something like that. And there are some who are concerned that when colleges like MIT and Bucknell and Stanford and Swarthmore, highly selective schools say character matters, that that will be gamed as well. And um, I think I'm answering your question when I say what we, we don't have an end point. This is not about a um, calculated credential. Um, this is about developing a purpose. Um, one of our, frankly, one of our um, character collaborative um, members is the Purpose Project and helping students understand, you know, fundamentally whether it's a, a sport, acting, or volunteerism, it's not the act itself. It's why do you do it? What, what's the purpose? Why does it matter to you? So um, I would say that that's what we want students to do is not looking at it as an endpoint or a goal or a credential, but because in the end, it will make them feel good. And in the end, it will make them more engaged and um, more engaged means you're likely in life, in college, in work to be more successful. So um, I guess we will continue to push the intrinsic benefits of volunteerism with the extrinsic being, you know, the, the resume building mm -hmm. as a secondary. Um, does, that, does that help? That helps. That helps. And so that's one of many questions. And so I just wanted to share some of the questions that we get frequently. Um, and what's really apparent is that students feel lost when it comes to volunteering. And some of the areas where it's easy to get lost is, is volunteering a requirement to get into college? 
and uh, Bill is here representing one college, and they they really differ. So you can't you can't spend too much time researching the college of your choice, making sure that that's a match for um, the type of experience that you want. Where do I find projects? That's probably the one that I get the most. And then close on the heels of that is what kind of projects should I choose? And it's such an individual choice. And we'll talk a little bit about, give some guidance about how you can go about doing that. How many hours do I need? And I'm glad that this question comes up because it gives me an opportunity to talk about, it's about the quality of your experience. It's about your fidelity to a specific cause area. So you may love children. And so maybe you're volunteering an off after school program to teach computer skills. And maybe you're volunteering to be a coach um, for AYSO soccer, an assistant coach or a referee, but it shows a theme, something about you. So focus on the quality and the depth, not so much a number. I had to put this in for fun. Can I buy volunteer hours? That is a question. It's Googled often. Um, the answer is not, not a volunteer cloud. <laughs> it's not a commodity? No, it's not. It's not. And then how do I track my hours? I've got some really good answers for you coming up. And then how do I report my volunteer experience to colleges? Today it's self-reported. And because it's self-reported and everybody does it a little bit differently, yes, there's an answer, there's a question on the Common App, for example, and it does ask um, very specific questions about volunteering and how long hours. There are so many different ways to represent um, your volunteer experience. And that's what um, Bill shared earlier today. And we've got um, some tools for you to do that. And so there are a lot of questions, but what colleges really know, and Bill teed this up nicely, is can you persevere? Um, because emotions drive everything. So developing those soft skills and those competencies and a way to channel your emotions in a way that's really productive for you it will affect everything you do, how well you learn, the relationships you make, um, your health. And uh, if when you master those skills, right along with um, honors calculus, you'll be really well prepared for that next chapter in your life. And as we've seen in the last few weeks, um, we never know what hand life will, will deal with us or will deal us. And so we do need to make sure that we're fortifying that part of ourselves um, by volunteering and connecting and engaging. And so the things that are making our lives meaningful, like volunteer work, maybe it feels like another thing that you're doing and just something, another requirement or something that's stressful. I promise you it will pay off. I have seen over the years, and I've been in, involved in volunteering for many years, students who go into it, sometimes even reluctantly, they become the best volunteers because you don't have to be the smartest, you don't have to be the fastest, you just have to give of yourself and um, you learn so much in the process, more than you'll ever know, maybe even for a decade. So right now, uh, COVID-19 is testing our non-cognitive skills. And if anyone wants to add anything to the chat about you know, how volunteering has helped them deal with this crisis. Um, we'd love to hear from you on that. So speaking about perseverance, there are some people that are larger in, than life and they've had their rough moments too. So this is Priscilla Chan Zuckerberg and she's a great example of how when you arrive on campus, you will be tested. And so you have to have something that makes you feel like you're a part of something bigger than yourself, that it's not just about your personal goals, but there's a purpose to what you're doing. So I'm going to share um, a few minutes of a video with you. She landed at Harvard on a full scholarship, a dream, but one she never imagined would almost break her. My one sh skill set of being smart, I wasn't smart there anymore. I, um, I, never, I didn't fit in. And I was like, oh my gosh, I don't belong here. I actually filled out my transfer paperwork to, to leave. You did? I did. Oh, it was so hard. Um, and so I, 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 I was ready to leave and... Um, but then a child changed her life. I worked at a low-income housing project right next door to where I grew up. I met a little girl, she's uh, 
10 years old and I, she, her school counselor came to the after school program looking for her. And I just like walked out to uh, the playground in the housing project and I found her. And I saw that her two front teeth were broken and I was devastated. I thought, what happened? What did I do wrong? Thinking, what did you do wrong? Like, what, did I miss something that led her to actually get hurt? I still remember that moment with anguish and anger and uh, a desire to fight so that other kids aren't like that. Chan went on to teach and then to medical school. As she... I think the point is well made there, that there will be times in your life that you'll want to quit and there will be something um, that you've prepared yourself for all your life and you'll need a reason to stay in the game. And can you imagine a time, can you imagine what today would be like if Priscilla Chan Zuckerberg had not persevered, if she had not encountered that little girl that gave her a sense of purpose? And I forget if this was in the narrative, but that was actually a volunteer project, a volunteer um, internship that she was doing on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so she was able to find a reason to hang on, even when she felt like she didn't possess the skills. Um, it wasn't about possessing the skills at that point in time. It was about the purpose, and that sustained her. So that's a good segue into volunteering should be personal. You may want to develop something in yourself that's very different from what your best friend or the person sitting across from you in, in class or even somebody who's part of your um, volunteering team wants to develop. Maybe you love coding, and so you belong in a community-based organization teaching underserved skills an hour of code. That's a great way to realize that. Or maybe you care deeply about the environment, and so you lead a team um, on a surf rider's uh, day to uh, help pick up trash and so that sea turtles aren't investing that. Maybe it's something that you just really love. You care about animals. You want to see that animals have good, safe homes or you're part of the LGBTQ uh, community and you want to get awareness out there, or you, you're really focused on children. Um, it doesn't have to be academic related. Maybe you're really curious about something. What does, what does the life of somebody in um, the armed services look like? What about if you were to go overseas and volunteer? What would that country look like? Those can be very rich, fulfilling experiences. And maybe you wanna get good at something. Um, maybe you want to develop yourself uh, spiritually. Maybe you want to learn something more about the arts. Um, or maybe you just want to be more involved in sports. Um, I have an intern who just decided to volunteer after school um, at, for a volleyball team, and he volunteered his way into a job. He never realized he loved volleyball so much. Mm. And then I think this really speaks to our time. Maybe you want to amaze yourself. Maybe you are sitting there thinking, I can do something about one of the worst pandemics. I don't have to just sit here and be afraid. And so get involved in disaster relief. Get involved um, in something related to refugees, whatever your passion is. So that's, that's your job is to figure out what you want. But I hope I've given you some good advice about that. This is really my job. I talked to you about what we created with Volunteer Crowd, and you'll learn more. But I really want to speak to why we did it. Um, I've got three boys. Collectively, they volunteered over a thousand hours, and I can tell you the process, it's really awful sometimes um, because you have to hunt and peck around the internet for volunteer opportunities. Um, a lot of times you have to track your hours on paper, and then you've got some to get somebody to say, yes, uh, that person volunteered. And then it, when, when it comes time to report this on a college app, it's something that you're supposed to just figure out from middle school through part um, way of your senior year. How many hours did you volunteer? That's really hard. And so if you're not part of a school or club or you lack access. And if you're not in a private school or um, if you uh, are in a demographic where you don't or you don't have family members who can drive you around, it becomes even harder. And it's one of the easiest thing. It's one of the best things you can do. And in, in my opinion, it shouldn't be one of the hardest things you do. And then you need it to follow you like your academic transcript. Um, can you imagine going from middle school to high school or changing schools 
um, in the middle of high school and your grade's not going with you. Right now, when you volunteer for a school or a club, your record tends to stay with them. And so you never have this big view of all of the volunteering that you've done. So we wanted to fix that. And the way we fixed it is to create a mobile app um, that is really built for how students navigate their lives today. Um, we wanted to put in your hand one app that does it all, where you can find volunteer opportunities that are relevant to you, your location, and, um, and also your area. And we also have volunteer um, projects abroad. Uh, thank you for that question in the chat. We want to make it easy for your hours to get verified. So just spend a few minutes, add your volunteer hours, um, make sure we've got a contact, and we'll do the rest. And then we want to make sure that the work you're doing is, is working for you and you're getting recognition for that. So we're a certifying organization for the President's Volunteer Service Award. Um, and we want you to get endorsements for that. Um, Bill talked earlier about your strengths. How in the world do you know what your strengths are? Well, sometimes we know our strengths because other people tell us. And so um, what Volunteer Crowd's student app does is it allows you to get um, endorsements for your strengths and skills. And then finally, we put it all in a portfolio. And so- oh, Amy, if I could jump in, I just noticed the question about volunteering locally better than service trips abroad. Um, and somebody may have picked up earlier when I talked about paying $5,000 to do a volunteer trip to Costa Rica. Um, I was being a, a little bit uh, cynical, I must admit, but more importantly, I was underscoring that um, we really, we don't care about the exotic. We, we think a lot of young people have local communities that are very much in need of help. And not that we're going to ding them for jumping over those local needs, but I can, I would want everybody to know that if this volunteer um, activity is two blocks away from your house, that's wonderful. It doesn't have to be halfway around the world. So I think it's right in front of you. And, and again, that app is probably going to give you that kind of proximate opportunity. Yes, and we are here to um, make sure that we help you find that volunteer opportunity. So here is the portfolio that we create, and this is something that you will be able to send to colleges um, using Parchment. They're one of our partners, and it's about you, not your numbers. Now, obviously, there are some numbers there. We want to make this information digestible. You will have to answer some questions on apps and rather than you trying to pull every piece of paper together and figure out how many hours you've done or look back at the in your app, um, we want to just give you that information to make it easier. But really it's about showing what motivates and inspires you. So one of the things I can guarantee is that no two portfolios will, will be the same. There are a million volunteer organizations out there and you will spend your time differently than someone else. And that's absolutely the point, that you are different. And what you care about, the causes that you really glob onto, and the organizations you serve, that is about you. And that's what your future stakeholders want to know about. That's the, what the colleges that you apply to want to know about you. What do you care about? What are you motivated to put your time and energy into? Oops, I'm sorry, Bill. You had a question. I, I just, I just noticed, um, you know, uh, the reference somebody asked about the IB curriculum and you know the the community service uh, volunteer dimension to that. Um, you know, I, I don't know exactly the the subtleties of the IB um, and how they incorporate volunteerism, but I would want to make everybody understand that. Um, those who are taking AP tests, for instance, this cycle, they're, they're going to be different than they were last year. The IB uh, program is going to be cataloged differently, but colleges are understanding those changes. And so I, I would just want to reassure students that are in an AP or IB program 
that we understand what's had to, what has had to change given the COVID-19. So um, what I want them to do is focus on completing their academic program, staying healthy in mind and in body and trust colleges um, to, you know, understand what's happened, um, you know, to their program. So again, don't know the subtleties of volunteerism, but do know that we're aware that the curriculum has, has had to be adapted. Okay. And uh, IB stands for International Baccalaureate. Um, I see that in the chat as well. Yeah, and IB, International Baccalaureate, correct. Yes, and then how do colleges look at the Girl Scout Gold Award and the Eagle Scout Award? Um, I'm going to let Bill take that one since he represents a college. <laughs> Sure. Well, I, I, I like to tell the story. I, I was not a Boy Scout. Um, mm -hmm. I was 11 kids. And so my parents really didn't have much time for, you know, being um, a Cub Scout um, um, moderator or whatever. But I do remember my first year in college admissions in 1981. And um, I didn't know what an Eagle Scout was. And I remember in, in a committee, I looked at the student, I said, well, who cares, an Eagle Scout. And my colleague across the table was an Eagle Scout. And, you know, I, and he educated me, um, as I'm sure I educated somebody else about valuing something. So the Girl Scout uh, Gold Award, the Eagle Scout, the, the beauty is that if there's an um, ignorant admission officer like me in the room, there's about two or three others who will say, wait a minute, let me explain what that is. And it's very important. So those are two examples of what we know are linear commitment, pers you know, uh, persistence. You don't just do it in one weekend. So those are ones that are very important to us. Um, and if we don't know what it means, we seek somebody out who can help us. That's great. I noticed we've got a lot of questions coming in, so I'm going to go ahead and get through and then at the end address those. And I also want to reassure everyone that we will um, reach out directly with your questions, with answers to your questions. So we are partnered with the National Society of High School Scholars. They do an incredible job um, of, of providing programs on leadership and helping you understand what the options are with colleges, with all of these different conferences. And so we're, we're really pleased to be able to offer this to the members where it's $10 off the $99 program. And so it's an annual program, um, just like if you were to join a club. Um, but one of the things about Volunteer Crowd, it, it is uh, portable. So you can go across all different types of um, causes. And a lot of the students who uh, work with us at Volunteer Crowd are already in a club or their school offers something. So um, it's for everyone, really. And uh, I, I'd love to just come back to what we're all going through because we are going through it together. And uh, the question about whether or not you can meet your, your volunteer hour requirement for your IB program, I would answer similar questions like this. Don't waste a crisis. There are so many things to be learned in a crisis and there are so many different ways. And the fact that you're here asking these questions shows that you're looking for ways to participate. And so if you visit our blog, we have a few posts. Um, there is a tremendous amount of demand right now for online tutors. And so you can volunteer with nonprofits and you can be a tutor for a younger student. There are over 55 million students trying to learn from home and not everybody is set up for success. And the teachers, they can't even tell you how much they appreciate the extra support. Social media service projects. This is the digital generation and nonprofits love that about you. They want to see how your skills can help their cause. And then just general coronavirus, um, uh, general coronavirus uh, pro related projects. So we're here to help. And then this is our, uh, we'll send this out afterward, but this is our greatest of all time socially distant projects. And I put this up here, I won't read it all, but I wanted to show you what the range is right now to give you all encouragement that there are a lot of things that you can do in a lot of different cause areas. We have 20 different cause areas. And um, so we can find something that fits uh, your, your um, desires, your interests, um, your schedule. We work with so many nonprofits. 
And at this point, I want to save the best for last and uh, turn it over to Bill for the close. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks, Amy. Um, I, before I do, I, I just saw the wonderful and incredibly honest um, observation from a junior in the audience who's concerned that to date, um, he or she doesn't have a, a, a real catalog of volunteer activity because of other extracurriculars. And so the focus today was on volunteerism as, as it could play a role in college admissions, but please be, be, let me be clear, we don't expect every student to have every characteristic. And there are many students whose commitments to a 20 hour a week job to help the family or 25 hours in the house to help with you know, child care or adult, you know, um, elder care, or, you know, being in a play across the, the scan of the whole school year. Those are all very important. And just like volunteerism, they have dimensions of persistence and empathy and grit. So it's, it, there's no formula. So, um, if this has prompted you to say, gosh, I'd love to do some volunteer work because it sounds like something that will tap into a dimension I'm not aware of in myself, that's great. But don't make a mad rush to try to build your credentials if you're already fully engaged in areas of activity that are commitment oriented. So the focus is on volunteerism, but I don't want you to feel like that's what the one single thing we're looking at. So just when you know, there's this notion among um, people about the soft skills um, and soft skills being communication skills, understanding written uh, work versus the hard skill, which is um, coding and um, chemistry. So you can get into medical school. Those this notion of soft skills is not something I really buy into. I think things like empathy and grit and persistence and caring and creativity are competencies. They're things that just work um, and make you a more effective student. Um, look at a mission of, of the colleges. I put up Swarthmore's here as an example. Um, you know, our purpose is to make our students more valuable human beings and more useful members of society. You know, so they're an elite um, academic institution. And yes, they expect you, if you're going to get a, mass, a bachelor's degree in physics, you better know physics. But what they're really inculcating in their four years is this sense of being a, a well-rounded human. Um, the Gallup Purdue index, which I showed, I show here is now in its sixth year and there's more than 200,000 college graduates from public, private, large, small, selective, non-selective that they've um, surveyed to find out what made a difference in being an engaged student and an engaged employee and an engaged community member. And the key factors were not their GPA, it was not their major, it was not how selective the school was that they attended. It was wherever they were, did they get um, support? Did they have a mentor, somebody who cared about their success? Did they have more than one or two activities that spanned more than one semester? And Frankly, in a college and in a high school, what spans one semester typically is a, a job or a volunteer activity that isn't, you know, semester by semester. They expect you to show up at the soup kitchen in October and through April. So what they find is that those who say that they're fully engaged or more engaged in their workplace the single most important characteristic is that they were engaged as an undergraduate. And that had more to do with activities outside the classroom, to be quite honest, 
than inside. So um, again, I think this is about whether it's volunteering um, or um, doing research, uh, doing an internship, anything you can do that is more extended in time and a greater commitment of persistence, um, the more valuable it is in the long run. I see we're at the top of the hour and we will have to reach out for some of these questions um, a little later. Um, I did want to just thank everybody for coming and I hope uh, we've been able to address a lot of your questions. I wanted to thank Bill. I wanted to thank the National Society of High School Scholars. I mean, it's and I wanted to thank all of you for your questions and assure you we will get back to you. Um, if you're interested in uh, reaching us directly, just go to volunteercrowd.com and go to the footer and look for our contact page. Bill, what's a good way for everyone to reach out and uh, and um, reach. Well, I think a, a great way, you know, um, I'm happy to take a direct email, um, bill, B I L dot Conley, C O N L E Y, at Bucknell dot edu. And if you want to learn more about Bucknell, obviously Bucknell dot edu, and um, you will find our website. But um, again, happy to take questions directly through email. Um, Amy, it was a pleasure. Um, thank you to the folks at uh, the National Society of High School Scholars for sponsoring this. It's been a great evening. Yes, thank you. And that's a great idea. So we'll go ahead and just uh, make our email address available to you as well, the stu students at volunteercrowd.com. Everyone stay safe, stay well, and uh, thank you for your time. Have a wonderful evening. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.